Tonight we're going to be looking at a design review and kind of design overview of the 3847 2022 robot. Um, so we're going to go through and break it down into its five main mechanisms and talk about why we kind of chose some of those design choices and look at how each one of those builds up um, to make the entire robot um, function, kind of how we allocated space and kind of integrated everything together. Um, so the five mechanisms that this robot kind of gets broken into are the drivetrain. So this is everything that you see in orange here. So this is everything that's going to drive it around the field, kind of its main chassis, um, bumpers, bumper mounting, um, anything that's just kind of that main mobile base for the robot that doesn't interact with any of the other game pieces or anything is what we call the drivetrain. Um, and that's going to be similar on a lot of the robots. They're going to be very similar setup, especially now that we've kind of committed to these swerve modules, which we'll talk about in just a second. This is going to look similar to our 2021 robot that we built, and very likely to our 2023 robot as well. Um, the second mechanism is the intake. So this is how we get the cargo or the balls up from the floor and into the robot. Um, so this is everything in orange here is what we consider the intake mechanism. Um, our third mechanism is kind of the bridge between the intake and the launcher. So it's what we call the ball path. So it's everything that once the ball's up into the robot, how do we sort of control it and how do we move it nicely and feed it into the launcher so we get a nice consistent shot every time um, and we're able to accurately put the ball in the goal. Because if you don't feed it well, you end up getting all sorts of different shots too. So this is really useful to have the ball path mechanism do that. Um, it ended up adding in like the intake camera because that just made sense of how it was mounted. And a few other bits of the main structure kind of all got integrated into ball path here um, so that everything else could be mounted to it. The launcher assembly is what actually shoots the cargo out of the robot. Um, so that's where we have the big spinning rollers. They're spinning really fast. And they do the final aiming, or they do the final actual launching of the ball. And then we also have the camera that's used for aiming, which is called the limelight. And that's how it's able to know automatically how to lock on to the goal. Um, and again, allow us to have those like accurate shots. And the final mechanism is our climber. Um, so there's some few hidden parts. There's probably some updates we need to do to make the climber CAD more reflective of what's really on the robot. Um, this is where the state of it at the moment, so we'll go through it. But this is how we get up and grab onto the mid bar and then do our monkey bar swings onto the latches and get all the way to reversal as well with this climber mechanism. Um, okay, so that's what all five mechanisms do. Let's look at each one and how they actually do it and why we made those choices. Um, so drivetrain is always going to be our mechanism one. We number each mechanism so that we have an easy way to sort them and just kind of refer to them when we have them in slides or any other reference thing. So drivetrain is almost always going to be our one. And so the main point of our drivetrains um, in the modern years, the last two years or so, is that we have four swerve modules, one in each corner. And so these each have a drive motor and a steering motor. So we have a drive motor um, here that's able to drive the actual um, wheel itself and turn it going forward and backwards. And then we have a steering motor that's actually rotating the wheel. So it's able to spin it uh, kind of like a shopping cart caster or the, the caster on the bottom of an office chair, but it's also powered. So we can tell it which way to point and which way to drive. And when you do that with all four of them, that allows us to drive sideways, forward, backwards at angles. It also allows us to rotate while we're driving in a single direction. And that's a really big advantage for this game because we can be aiming at the goal while moving to set up to where we actually want to shoot. So we can be aiming at the same time, having it kind of rotate and move or get in position to intake a ball or anything while we're driving towards the ball or towards our shooting location. Um, the rest of the chassis is rather simple. It's basically just these one by two um, tube. This is one of the simplest ways that we build robots is just one by two, two or two by one extrusion. So it's two inches tall by one inch. And these are just bolted to each module in each corner. And that's providing all of the structure. Um, so we don't have to have any other frame parts or anything. We have the lower swerve plate and the upper swerve plate here. And those are just bolted in through the corners. And that's doing the main 
structural loop of the entire robot, and that's giving everything so it's not able to um, bend or flex anyway, um, and it's strong enough to last a full season and work for our needs pretty well. Um, we've added a couple things. We have some like 3D printed corner modules that help make some things legal for like bumper perimeter um, and frame perimeter and things like that, but those aren't really necessary all the time. You could get away without those, um, but they do help for in certain things that we're doing. Um, the drivetrain also has the layout for most of the main electrical system. So we have like the power distribution board, RoboRio, which is the main computer for the robot, um, the pneumatic system where we compress air to be able to use to like deploy the intake and part of the climb, um, has how we mount and hold the battery back here in the back. Um, so that all works to um, let us have a kind of a driving robot. So you could pretty much put this on the ground and the robot could drive around. It wouldn't be able to do anything with the balls, but everything would work pretty much with everything that's here in drivetrain. Um, there are definitely some things we need to work on in the future. We had multiple issues with the way we did the battery mount here to where we end up having to make some extra polycarb plates and reinforce some things. We actually broke the wooden part of our belly pan here. Um, we use wood for a variety of reasons, mostly because it's light and very stiff. Um, and those are two properties we want in something this large. We don't want to have something really heavy. So if we did it like entirely out of aluminum, um, we could make it really thin, but then it wouldn't be as stiff for the same amount of weight. But with wood, you get something that's easy to manufacture because we can just put it on our laser cutter really fast. Um, and it's very, very strong um, when it's fully supported. But we ended up having some really thin sections here. So you can kind of see how thin this is. And with the weight of the battery and some of the impacts, we were able to crack these and break them. So we ended up reinforcing them with some aluminum or with some polycarb. And that worked well for a little while. And I think we even broke the polycarb. So we may want to look at redoing something like this in the future and making it um, a little bit stronger, having less really thin gaps in the plywood belly pan. Um, these two blocks here are designed specifically so that the robot can sit nicely on the cart that we use for it. Um, so if you didn't have these blocks, it would be harder for the robot to sit on the two rails that we have. Um, they also work a little bit when we're lifting, sometimes off the climbing bar. We can use the two by fours to grab and maneuver the robot a little bit. Um, and they don't add a ton of weight, but they do provide a little bit of stiffness. And really, they're just mostly there for when it's sitting on the cart is the main thing. Um, a couple other bits that we've been over. So we have a this the way we do our bumper latches this year are with these three parts here. This part is on the actual bumper. It comes down from the top and this latches into place. It's able to rotate around this little pivot down here. These didn't work all that well. They were okay. Um, probably like a C if we were giving them a grade. And there's some improvements we can do to make them better. We're one of the few teams who does things in this manner. And we kind of started it in 2021. Um, it has some advantages. It doesn't have to go inside of the frame much at all. There's nothing like sticking out over these rails. So you can have side, profile, side panels kind of all the way up to the side here. Um, which sometimes is useful, but there are definitely other ways we could have done it and made it um, potentially easier for the bumpers not to any any of them to be unlatched or anything at the end of the match. Um, so I think that's most of the drivetrain. We do have another rail here that's used for supporting some of the things above it um, with some cutouts for wire runs so that we can have everything get power and control wires run through this rail without having to go over it or anything. Um, so yeah, so nothing's too complicated in the drivetrain, and that's one of the reasons why we moved to Swerve, is we can get a much simpler drivetrain where we're not having to design a lot of complicated sheet metal pieces or anything. If you go back and look at our previous robots from 2020 and before, they all had a lot more design work into the drivetrain. It took a lot more time and effort to make those drivetrains that we weren't putting into being able to do things that actually scored us points. Uh, moving up from the drivetrain, we get to the intake so our intake this year um, this is it in its deployed or its stowed configuration you can see it here where it's deployed and it can actually it should just be able to fold up yep uh, this mostly works okay so we can see 
There it goes. So this is basically what the intake looks like at the start of the match. I don't know if... Oh, that'll fold mostly. Okay. So this is basically what the robot looks at the start of the match. So at the very beginning of the match, you have to be inside what's called your frame perimeter. You're not allowed to have things sticking out above where your bumpers are. So everything has to be pretty flat. Uh, so like this edge, if you draw like an imaginary line going vertical, everything has to fold up inside of that. And then as soon as the match starts, we're allowed to fold everything down. So the intake comes down and it hits what we call the kicker bar down because this like kind of kicks the balls up. And then it also releases part of the ball path here. And this is how we actually play the game most of the time we're actually going around intaking. Um, the intake is designed to be relatively simple. Um, we had, well, it's also not made it apparently correctly. That's a new one. Um, okay, well, we just won't do that right now. But we'll go in and somebody, we should go in and fix the mates. They may have updated the pulley or something and messed it up. Um, but we do have a single roller intake. So there's only a single roller that actually deploys outside of our frame. If you go in and look at a bunch of the other 2222 robots, they have multiple rollers to be able to get the ball up and over the bumper. Um, the way we're able to accomplish it with only a single roller is that our pneumatics here are set up so that they're only pushing out with a certain amount of force. So as the ball actually comes under the intake, this rises up with the ball. So the roller is able to stay in contact with the ball for longer um, and force it all the way under and into our first ball path roller here so that it doesn't actually lose contact with the ball until they're both touching and this one brings it under um, we had been doing a few different ideas of how we wanted to do the intake how we wanted to kind of get it stowed around where the initial climber was and things and having a single pivot with a single roller seemed like the better idea um, and for part of the season it worked very well so we had we did have we had very little issues with it in our first two districts. There were a few minor things, um, but as we started getting into the state championship and world championship, we started having a lot more issues as we were playing a little bit more aggressively. Um, whether it was just us going after balls that were in places that were a little bit harder to get and damaging the intake, or having other um, defensive robots or just other robots in general running into our intake and having it cause problems. So we were able to, and eventually we were having issues where we were just able to completely bend and break this rod that's out here to basically kind of protect that roller. We were able to break that and then also bend the entire intake roller as well. Um, and that left us without being able to intake during a few matches when that was broken. Um, and we had a few issues with the pulleys as well, where the belt would come off or something of that, that nature. Um, Similarly, down here, we have the two different types of pulleys. So we'll go through this um, more in the future, but we have um, the smaller pulley teeth here, which are three millimeter, and the larger here, which are five. And these three millimeter pulleys, we started having some issues with over um, just kind of wear as we were going into the season. We were playing more matches, testing the robot for longer. We eventually completely broke a belt where we like ripped the teeth off one of the belts. Um, and we started having some issues with the printed pulleys here as well. So these are all 3D printed. We we're having some issues with the flanges and some other things that were causing us to have to replace these um, a little more often um, than we would like. Um, in general, it was definitely a reasonable intake. It, it didn't. It accomplished the goals of avoiding. Um, we didn't really have too many issues with it getting cracked from the side. I think we eventually had to replace a side plate from some impact, but most of the time it was working pretty well. And some of that was even just preventative maintenance where it was it was still functional. Um, and that was part of the goal of having the double thick plates and it being really strong here with all of the standoffs so that if it was getting run into, um, it wouldn't break that way. Because we've had those issues in the past where we were breaking our intake side plates. And so part of our design going into this season was to avoid that. And we did a pretty good job of avoiding um, the intake side plates taking a lot of damage. But we ended up moving that damage to the intake roller itself, um, which is not ideal because it still doesn't mean you can intake. Um, some of the things we might have been able to do and we had some plans to do, but we were kind of hitting it close on weight, is it is designed to be able to have a motor on both sides and a belt on both sides. So currently the intake motor is here. It spins this kind of cluster pulley 
here that has a belt going back to here and then up to the intake itself. And so it's designed to be able to run another motor on the opposite side. So everything is fully mirrored. And so you can have a, another motor here and another belt running up this side. And so in that case, it might have worked a little bit better when we did have those few belt problems we were having into. So we might have been able to keep it running for a few more matches. But those matches where we ended up completely destroying this tube, where it was bent out of place, where it just couldn't spin at all, that wasn't going to happen either. Um, a couple of things we've done since then is 8515 is running a new setup to where it doesn't have this full tube running through the middle. This is what we call a dead axle assembly. Um, so instead of having this tube be like a live drive shaft where it's spinning and everything mounted to it is spinning. This tube is just acts as a um, structural support. It's just bolted across um, the entire intake here. And the only thing that's spinning is the actual roller on top of it. Um, so on 8515 currently we have a um, kind of what we call a stub axle assembly. So instead of going all the way across, the tube kind of just ends right here after the pulley. Um, and so it's just structurally just a little piece sticking off from each side. Um, and that makes it so we can't bend the aluminum tube in the middle. Um, if it just the polycarb is able to kind of flex and hopefully stay um, without getting beat up as much as the aluminum tube does when we take those really big impacts. Uh, in general, our design philosophy is to not use a lot of small wheels like we'll see a lot of other teams do. Part of this is because of cost, part of it's because of how the spares work and just being able to keep maintenance and stuff, being able to actually clean the rollers easily. When we have the, um, we have a rubber uh, silicone that stretches over the entire rollers um, and that gives us a very easy surface to clean. When you have a lot of individual wheels, a lot of times they'll get um, hair or debris or other things caught up in them and they'll lose some of their grippiness and they get really hard to clean because it literally gets like wrapped around them. They're just not easy to wipe down. We're here, we have this one solid roller. We can easily clean it between matches and keep it grippy to grab the balls. Uh, let's see, I think that's most of the intake. So yeah, so the only other part of that is the way that we actually do the mounting. So the mounting here for the pivot is a single plate off the side of the drivetrain. So that just gets mounted right here off the side of the drivetrain. And then the inside pivot is one of the things that is a little tricky for a lot of teams to do with Swerve because you don't have a nice place to mount a second one of those plates or anything. There's no easy um, tube structure or anything here that you can mount off of. Um, so what we chose to do was to create sort of a plate here suspended over the swerve module that allowed us to basically mount off the front rail and our mid rail back here um, and then connect across. So that gave us another point to mount this pivot, um, which worked well for us. We didn't have very many issues with these plates during the season. Um, so this is definitely something we could do again. The other way teams can do this is instead of having um, a plastic plate out here, if you have just a aluminum plate where it's going to be a little stronger and a little more rigid. Um, you can have the intake just pivot off that plate and not have anything on this side. Um, that would work, if, especially if it's like a single polycarbonate plate or something, a single plate that's moving. Um, if you have three plates like we do and we're trying to have like the pulley in there and things, that definitely gets a little harder to do when we're using that joint for everything. Um, but that does, that's just a design choice, so we could do it another way. But this definitely did work. This allowed us to have the motor mounting and everything here. Um, this would get complicated in other setups. So the way we have this built is we can take the entire swerve module out the bottom of the robot. If we didn't do it that way and we kind of move things around where the swerve module needs to come out the top, that would definitely be a problem where this is mounting over it. You'd also have to take a good chunk of the intake off to be able to swap one of the front two swerve modules, which may be an issue. So a lot of times when we're designing things, we are looking all the way through to think about how maintenance is gonna work. If we do need to make a change, if we have to swap something really fast, we might only have 10, 15 minutes between a match. So we wanna be able to swap things and make a change and repair something very, very quickly. So we're trying to think that through as much as we can during the design process. So we don't end up in season, getting to a point where we just can't make a fix 
um, before the, our next match. Um, okay, so coming through the intake, once the intake, once the ball kind of gets up and in, we go into the ball path assembly and kind of the whole main structure of the robot as well. Um, so this is the entire ball path um, mechanism. The moving parts of it are just these three rollers um, and the pivot here. Um, the belt is not constrained properly, um, but that would actually normally stay here and get powered there. Um, but a lot of the rest of it are a lot of little details that allow the entire robot to work. So it's how do we have these little wings here that allow the balls to be funneled in to a nice clean path so we know that they're centered enough so they can launch out of the um, robot cleanly and accurately. And so we were able to make these, these are a little bit of a late addition. We had already done some amount of the intakes and some amount of even the ball path. Um, so those get mounted here on these intake rails. And these are just 3D printed um, blocks that are set up so that you have bolts coming in through the back to mount to here and then through the front here for these plates. Um, these are polycarb that get bent. Um, so they come around this one by one and provide that angle for us. Um, the game piece this year allowed us to do this where we didn't have to do any sort of um, motorized or it's called active centering. So we didn't have to have another wheel or motor or anything kind of pushing um, the balls physically sideways or another wheel like kicking them sideways. We could just be pushing them forward with these top rollers and run them into this slick polycarb wedge and they would kind of slide across um, the ground and go in where we wanted them to up into our curved um, kind of part of our lower S section of the ball path. Um, these rollers are all designed to be the same style as the intake. So that lets us use the same um, bearing methods, the same mounting methods, um, a lot of the same 3D printed setups, all of those can be very similar. So if we can make improvements to something on the intake, we can use those improvements on the ball path and even up on the launcher in certain parts of it as well. So instead of having everything kind of engineered on its own, if we can use the same mechanism over and over again. We, can kind of, we were able to get the benefits of any improvements um, that we make throughout any of the systems. Um, again, most of our mechanisms that are dealing with the ball path, pretty much everything is just a motor with a pulley on it. And that pulley powers a belt. So there's another belt here that's not in CAD currently or not visible. Um, and that's spinning these two rollers in unison. And there's another motor here that powers this roller, this larger four inch roller that actually does the feeding of the balls up into the launcher. Um, so that's where this ball, they store down here. So you have one and two. And then once we're ready to actually fire, this spins up. All of these on the launcher, these rollers back here in this main launcher wheel are spinning very quickly and the ball launches out. Uh, some of the things that we had to figure out how to do well was some of this suspension and things back here. So how did we um, end up just being able to have a one by one come up without any sort of rear support back here? Um, so that was one of the ways we were able to do that kind of early in the design process was know that the climber was going to have this like crossbar. So once we were able to kind of get this shape as part of the climber design, um, we were able to use that to allow our ball path to mount to that crossbar in the rear. And we could keep the rear sort of belly pan of the intake or of the drivetrain pretty open and empty. So we didn't have to have another mounting point anywhere where we have all these electronics, quite a bit of our wiring, the battery, all of that was able to kind of stay open. And we were pretty much just floating all of this ball path mechanism up above it, um, which worked out well enough. Um, we do have some sensors. So these little mounts here are IR sensors um, so that we can know where the balls are kind of in the path. So we don't feed a ball too early up into the launcher. Um, again, like I said earlier, we have like this camera mount here. Some of these got really, really tight, um, as we were figuring out how to design it. So some of the on shape things we can do, if I switch over to our driver camera mount, 
um, part studio, I think. Yes, yeah, so we can see what it looks like in context um, and see somewhat how we had to do some of this design. So these are the actual places where we're going through and making each of these parts. If it wants to load, because this ended up being rather close or not. OK, maybe I won't do that today. Um, well, part of that, what I was going to show is how close this shape is. So all of this curve here and this shape is so that the camera mount doesn't interfere with our launcher mount here. So there actually gets rather close to some of these pulleys and belts and all of these things up on the launcher that we don't want it hitting. So we were able to go through and integrate that pretty tightly. Um, we ended up realizing, though, and asking to do some modifications afterwards, that this whole plate could actually shake a little bit side to side. And that was causing um, this belt and pulley to actually come in and hit the side here. Um, so we ended up cutting a little bit more out of this. So we cut away some more on the ones that we have on the robot so that it's not doing that anymore. And we could have that clearance um, as that was causing some issues with that belt and causing some things to skip and things. Um, so a lot of times we're always trying to iterate and find little improvements that we're not always going to catch in CAD where we didn't notice that it does. It definitely doesn't hit here when it's modeled perfectly, but in the real world where things can shift around a little bit, they can move, they can shake, you might miss some things and then you have to modify them um, in on the real robot. Ideally, we'd come back through and make the new part a little bit different and make a new part for it. For something like the camera mount, it wasn't as necessary. We could just cut it. We literally just cut it on a bandsaw, remounted it, and it worked fine. So we never actually did the CAD change. But some of those probably should get changed in CAD in case we ever need to make the part again. We won't have to do those manual operations. We can just have the laser cut part be ready to go already. And we're not redoing those same issues that we've already had. There it goes. Okay. Um, the other parts of the ball path and some of the structural pieces are these side plates. So these are kind of allow us to do, um, allow us to suspend it here. So we have these cut out of um, quarter inch polycarbonate um, and they have tubes running across to provide some structure side to side. There's a thin piece of bent polycarb um, that we laser cut and then get zip tied to these tubes for us to make that curve that we need to so the ball can go up and get into the launcher. Um, anytime we have these bent pieces in um, SolidWorks, we have a flattened feature when we're in the actual part studio for them. So if I come over and I switch to the ball path part studio, we should be able to see what that looks like and how we're able to actually laser cut that because you, anything where we're gonna cut out on the laser or the router, we want to be flat um, it doesn't work if we've modeled it bent and then we try to um, take that directly, but we can do it here. Uh, maybe. All right, yep. So we have over here, we have this flatten. And so we can go in and see the two different parts. Um, so this part is the ball path. And so that's what it looks like when it's actually flattened and not curved. And we have that same thing for this part up here or this part here where we have um, the curved part for our um, wings on the ball path that guided in the wedges. Um, Okay, let's see if Onshape wants to reload, maybe, so we can see the ball path again. No, it's, yeah, it's been rendering a little weird lately. I think we'll be okay. Um, let's see. If it ever happens, Onshape does that sometimes. You can just refresh the browser. It takes 30 seconds or so, and it comes back. Um, there we go. Okay, so now I have the rest of this set up. So let's see. So yes, yeah, so there are a few other places where we were able to integrate some of our design a little bit cleaner. So we were able to do things like where we knew we had the launcher coming up that needed to be mounted 
um, to these top rails. We were able to integrate those those mounting points into this rail and into our motor mount and like kind of pivot mount here. Um, instead of just using like the aluminum gussets everywhere, we can integrate some of the design a little bit and make sure things are positioned where we want um, and not have to like have anything um, overlapping or having plates overlapping or anything. We can keep part count a little bit lower uh, by doing things like this. Um, one of the things I didn't talk about intake and in any other place, whenever we're mounting or whenever we're making something where we have the motor going to a belt and pulley, later on we'll talk about how we design those like distances and how we make sure they're in the right spot for whatever belt we're using. But one of the important design concepts is that ideally the the mount for whatever the roller is and wherever that hole, however that's being mounted, and for the motor, those are always on the same plate if possible. So if we wouldn't want to like have this motor mounted back here and then have a belt running all the way up to this roller that's on a completely different um, part and plate. Because a lot of times you'll end up getting different measurements and different distances if they're not mounted the same way. Um, even though we're going through and riveting all of these holes and we have a lot of this all set up correctly, there just ends up being, you're adding a lot more places where there might be flex or misalignment or anything, and that might mess up the belt. So whenever we can, we want to have our motor mounting and our um, the actual roller or whatever's being powered by the motor all done on the same plate um, that we cut out either through the laser or the CNC router. Um, that's normally going to have us um, remove some of our potential problems. Um, one of the things that we didn't talk about is how this roller is done differently. So this roller was done differently because we needed it to be a much larger roller for it to kind of fit the balls up to the height we needed um, and just to fit the two balls nicely where it could touch the roller for long enough. If we tried to do it with a two inch roller, the balls wouldn't be able to both touch the wheel um, or the roller for long enough and the whole system wouldn't work right. So once we knew we had to go up to this four inch wheel, um, we were able to do that with um, VEX flex wheels that we could mount to a um, a different aluminum tube. So we could just power them all through that tube. And then here we have a, another dead axle assembly done a little bit differently. Um, so this is going to get a little bit more into the details. So we basically have a half inch round shaft here that's just going all the way across its ends are tapped so that we can have a bolt going into it to hold it in place. So this is just basically almost acting like a standoff going all the way tapped with bolts on each end. Um, and then we have a, then we have a shaft collar just holding it so it can't slide side to side. We could also put a spacer in there if we wanted, but the shaft collar worked um, and that let us make sure we weren't having any rubbing or anything if it started spinning, which it shouldn't, but in case anything did happen. Um, that worked well enough. And then here we have a bearing. So this is a ball bearing that lets it spin freely. So we don't have a lot of friction. So we're not like just spinning on plastic, spinning on aluminum or aluminum spinning on aluminum where it's rubbing and generating a bunch of heat. The ball bearings release a lot of that or reduce a lot of that friction, allow things to spin really nicely. So anytime we have anything spinning, especially spinning quickly, we want to make sure it's running on a bearing of some kind. And that bearing is just pressed into this tube. Um, so this is just an aluminum tube that has a bearing in each end. So it can spin nicely. And then we have the wheels stretched over it. Um, and they're kind of, um, you can see like their inside diameter is actually a little bit smaller. So we actually stretch them over. So they're like grabbing the tube. They're like a rubber and they're grabbing onto the tube. So if the tube moves, the wheels move. And then to be able to power the tube, we pr 3D print this pulley that has a clamp on it. And so we bolt it down and we clamp the pulley to the tube. And that's what allows for the tube to spin when the pulley spins. So that's just another way that we can um, use 3D printed pulleys to power some other part of the robot where we're not doing it um, like this, where we actually drill and bolt the tube to the pulley, um, pulley hub directly. We can also clamp the pulley to the tube too if it ends up being like a smaller tube or a bigger pulley. Uh, let's see. Yeah, a couple things. We did eventually, I think in season pretty quickly, we added these to stop the ball from kind of shifting out to the left or right. So they were 
keeping it just a little bit more centered. They're really thin and light and easy to do. Then eventually we also were able to put um, ball sensors or these light sensors on here as well so that we can know where the ball is um, and get it fully into the feeder wheel before trying to fire. Okay, so we have two more mechanisms left, the launcher and the climber. Uh, our launcher mechanism was based pretty heavily off of our 2021 launcher. We had somewhat luckily and through every team in first, the 2020 game, the 2021 game were the same and they were both ball launching too. And then so in 2022, when we had to do it again, we were able to look back and see what we liked from the designs that we had done for two years prior and kind of take and copy and improve on those designs pretty easily. Um, so we were knew pretty early that we wanted a pretty simple roller here that just had a drum of wheels that we could spin up with two motors and get them to the right speed to be able to launch. And then what we were able to figure out during the season um, through a couple of other teams' test videos and from some of the testing we did was that we knew we didn't want a ton of backspin on the ball because it would cause some bounce outs in the vertical goal. So if you had a ton of spin on the ball when you launched it, it would hit the goal, it would spin up like the opposite side and roll back out of the goal. It wouldn't stay in the bottom of the goal and actually count for points. Um, so the way that we were able to reduce spin and the way a lot of teams did it was you had these back rollers here um, that were able to launch the ball with less spin because they're rotating the opposite direction of our main launcher wheels. Um, so if this is rolling out this way and spinning out that direction, this side is rolling the other way and launching out that direction. So when it shoot out, you're able to have like a lower velocity on both of these wheels because they're both helping launch it um, and it ends up having less spin, which is helpful and part of what we were designing. That also meant we didn't have to have a physical hood structure. So sometimes like if you look at the 2021 robot, we had like physical like 3D printed um, like slats that slid in and out of each other um, that provided a surface for the ball to run against before it kind of touched the top rollers that that robot had as well. We were able to do it just with four rollers entirely so we didn't have to build the rest of a hood or anything like that. Um, the original design and the design pretty much all the way through our first um, district event had that we were going to actually be tilting this hood and adjusting the angle it could launch at. So this is all built to where it's pivoting around this bearing here. And at the beginning, we had servos that were like linear servos that could adjust the distance between this hole and this hole. And as you did that, this whole system would tilt up and down and give you a different release angle. Um, we were doing that because I thought we needed that for the variety of shots we wanted to be able to take on the field. Um, and it did work for a little bit. It was working OK. And then we started having issues where we were breaking the linear servos um, and we just couldn't we weren't getting a consistent shot the way we wanted. So we ended up just kind of staying with a single shot to make it easy. So for our first event, we had a very simple um, game plan to where we were only going to shoot from a certain distance away from the goal. We had a very basic autonomous mode um, that only did it shot two balls in an auton. Um, and we knew those were the things that we could do repeatedly. We could do really well. Um, and we could do it every single match um, and be enough for us to be able to perform well at that event. And we were correct. That allowed us to win that event with that very simple setup. So we didn't need to use any of the hood adjustments. We didn't really need to use a lot of the features that we were hoping to be able to have later in the season. Um, we just didn't have everything working yet since we had just finished building the robot. Um, from testing and being able to do that pretty early, we found out that with the back rollers and with the actual goals and with the actual balls, we were able to shoot quite a bit without changing the test the hood angle itself. Um, so we eventually just replaced those servos with a few different places that we were going to mount where we were able to just physically attach the hood into a specific angle. So we had a single release angle. So these like Lexan bars came in and replaced the servos. So it was just mounted here 
we added a little um, plate here and standoff so we could tie this down and stop it from being able to wiggle around too much. And so that gave us a um, quick way to kind of lock the whole hood in place and stop it from pivoting anymore or moving. And we only used a single angle, but we were still able to shoot from a lot of the places on the field that we thought were important and valuable for what we wanted to do. Uh, okay, so the way the launcher actually works to power all of these things is we have um, two Falcon motors up at the front here. They're stood off from their side plates. So this is one of the side plates here. Um, so they have this 3D printed box that stands off the Falcon motor. And then it has a belt going to um, the shaft here. So this shaft here is what we call a hex shaft. Um, if I can isolate that. So this is what's actually spinning inside of the wheels and inside both of these pulley setups out here on the sides. Um, and so that lets it so that when the shaft spins, when the pulley spins, everything spins in place with it. Um, and then we have a pulleys on the outside that allow us to run power back up to all of the hood rollers here. So this long belt goes from this pulley to the pulley here that's attached to this gear. So these are what are called herringbone gears. They have this like V shape. Um, the basic advantage is if we're ever 3D printing a gear for some reason um, and not a pulley, if we're 3D printing a gear, using the herringbone setup is better. It allows for the teeth to have more surface area in contact and to be stronger so you don't break teeth as much if you just printed regular like straight teeth gears it's pretty easy to deform the teeth or break the teeth um, these also run a little bit smoother and quieter because they stay in contact a little bit better um, and it doesn't take much more to print them or design them on shape makes it really easy to generate them um, so we use these both in 2021 and 2022 um, to get the hood to reverse direction so this pulley and this wheel is spinning the same way as this front wheel but we need them to reverse. And one of the things that gears let you do is very easily reverse the direction of rotation. So this shaft and this roller are spinning opposite directions. Um, in this case, if you're looking at this side, this roller is spinning counterclockwise and this roll and this gear down here is going to be spinning clockwise. And so that happens with both of these. And so we're able to power both of these first two rollers with just this gear. And then over here, we have belts that run down and power the other pulleys. So gears reverse direction, pulleys and belts, chain and sprocket, any of those types of things don't. Um, let's see. So we talked about dead axles a little bit before. So these are a similar setup. So these have that same half inch shaft running all the way through. Because we didn't, we needed it to be a little bit smaller um, and lighter potentially. So we didn't want to run the seven eighths the whole way through. Um, there were some reasons we didn't want to do that the same way we had run in ball path. Um, partially because the bearings here are a little bit better too, and these shaft, these rollers are spinning quite a bit faster than our intake or our ball path. Um, so we wanted these bearings to be spinning on it. Um, but they work the same way. So we just have bolts on the outside that bolt into this tube from both sides. And those are what actually allow this to have some structure. So you can't just like move these in and out separate from those shafts or anything. Um, and then they just have um, spacers and shaft collars here that allow us to swap the rollers pretty easily. We can just take out two bolts, take this top roller off, put a new one in, put those two bolts in, and it's ready to go again. Um, so a lot of this was done to try to keep maintenance easier so we're not having to stick shafts in and out of a lot of things. Most of the, everything on the robot can be replaced with about two bolts is kind of the goal for a lot of the rollers and any of the elements like that. That's kind of the goal. Um, let's see, the other part of this, we do have some more um, pieces. So we actually have the continuation of the curve. There's a second polycarb part and some more um, polycarb polycarb side plates and cross members um, standoffs here that support the rest of the S path. So this is how the ball actually comes up. It comes up this one 
and then that one. And so it comes up and then out that way. So you can kind of see it generates this like S shape here. And this is a pretty common design feature of a lot of teams. Some of them were more S than others, where maybe the launch is a little bit farther back. Um, but this kind of idea where you're just coming up and using that single wheel to feed everything nice and consistently up into the launcher. So it's always getting up to the launcher wheel at kind of the same um, speed and force. So then whatever the launcher wheel is spinning at, it can launch out at the same speed and force too. And accelerate that ball up and out and hopefully into the goal. Um, we use this space up here to mount some of our air tanks. Um, so I think by the, at the end of this, there's actually a third one up above it as well. That's not in CAD. Um, and then finally, we have the mount for our limelight camera where we are able to actually do the tracking of the goal. And we'll talk more about that as we start getting into controls. Um, but this is what sees that reflective tape, tells us where all the targets are, and then the RoboRio is able to calculate how much the robot needs to turn to be able to be on target and kind of be aiming at the center of the goal. All right, then the final mechanism is our climber. And this was definitely, we were probably one of the more unique climbers and we generated this fully kind of on our own. That doesn't make it better than other people's climbers. It probably makes it a little bit worse, um, but we did make it work. Um, and so we can go through at some point, we can talk through kind of kind of the prototyping process and what led us to go down this design. But part of what we were trying to do was to keep a lot of things very, very compact and keep most of the mounting and everything towards the rear of the robot. We knew we didn't want to interfere with the intake and ball path too much that was happening up at the front. Um, we also, at kind of early on, we weren't sure if our robot was going to have a turret or not, so it might have been spinning the launcher in the middle of it. So there was some push to have things a little bit further out and a little bit higher up if we could. Um, and then also just figuring out how to do it relatively lightly without too many linear things where you have to have a lot of bearing sliding. This can cause some issues if you don't do it exactly right. And we've had some issues in the past with doing them. They end up being just a little bit heavier and bigger. Um, so that's kind of why we were trying to move in some direction um, where we could just have rotary joints that worked to get the climb. Um, that ended up being what we were able to do. So the climber arms themselves, which I think don't know if they're working currently in CAD. Oh, there they go. They do. Um, are here. So this is what it looks like fully extended, where we have um, these two pneumatic cylinders that are able to push up this first joint. And then we have springs inside of here. So there's like a rotary spring that is always trying to open these two pieces. They're always trying to push out on this one and make it open. And then we also have... Um, a spring that's tied from basically this point back down to a point in here. And so it's always trying to flip it open as well. Um, and then there's a rope or a strap in this case that's actually tied on this shaft. It runs up, excuse me, over and through um, a couple of extra sets of bars that are in here that aren't in CAD exactly, but they end up going right through about here. Uh, we eventually, kind of the original design had them going over these tubes, but they started getting in the way of when we were actually hooking on the bar, so we load them down. Um, and that's where it actually pulls from. So this strap goes straight down, goes around this bar here, and gets pulled and, or gets wrapped around um, what we call the spool. So this tube back here gets powered by these Falcon motors. Um, we do currently have four on the climb. We probably don't need that. We probably only need two to run it um, effectively. Um, we did four to try to see if we could go a little bit faster. We ended up going too fast. And when it climbs with four motors at full speed, it doesn't have enough time to like latch properly. And we can bounce ourselves off the bar. Like we just climb so fast that the robot has enough momentum to like launch itself off the bar, which is not ideal. Um, there's probably a way that we could use that speed and get a little bit quicker, but we end up damaging things. And there's a lot of force here where we start bending some of these other rods and things. Um, so we did not want to do that. So that was not worth it. And the, the time we were saving was causing more swinging and some other things. So the overall climb time wasn't faster. Even if we could get to the bar faster, 
our overall climb time wasn't. So we ended up slowing down and making sure our climb was more reliable. Um, and we could still do it in a, about 10 seconds at our quickest, um, which was good enough for most matches that we needed it to. Um, the setup is basically these motors have a pinion gear. So that's the whatever the first gear or pulley or anything that's on the motor is called the pinion. And so in this case, it's a gear and it's driving the gear mounted on each side of the spool. Um, this hub is pressed into this tube, similar to how we had the tube on the ball pass. So this is actually the same tube here, but instead of clamping, we are pressing into here. That was actually one of our problems early on was we didn't end up pinning this like we should have. So we should have had a bolt going through the tube into the inside of this hub. You can kind of see the shape of the hub here in a second. So there's this inside surface here and we should have bolted into this. We should have drilled and put screw threads here so that we could have bolted in. And we didn't do that early in the season. That was causing when the motor would spin, instead of the tube spinning, the hub would just spin inside of this tube. And that was causing quite a bit of issues where we couldn't use the um, sensors that are in the motor to tell us how many times it spun. We couldn't use that to know how many times the um, actual spool and rope had spun because those were getting those were getting off. And that was causing a lot of our issues where it wasn't climbing correctly um, and it wouldn't pull when we actually wanted it to. So now they are pinned. We did that either going into state champs or going into world champs. I don't remember which one, um, but we did make that improvement and that solved a lot of our climber issues um, and made it more reliable. Um, but that whole setup again is very similar to what it was running before. This is again, just a half inch shaft with a half inch bearing here. And there's a bolt on this outside that bolts it. So in theory, the whole spool can come off by just do undoing those two bolts on either end. That stopped working when we started having some issues with the actual strap wrapping. So that's what these parts are for. These parts are here to hold the strap to wrap cleanly right around this outside part. As we started having some issues with it wrapping up next to the motors and not being consistent on both sides. And that was also causing some of our climb issues as well early on. So once we started getting it to cleanly wrap in a nice um, even setup on both sides, to where we could know how far it was wrapping and unwrapping. So we'd know how far it was moving this whole structure in and out. We could then um, climb a lot easier and more consistently. So we knew we were pulling on each side of the strap the, or each side of the climb the way we wanted to. Um, and we had all of the motor power and everything so it could actually climb. Um, the latch setup took several iterations. So these, the latches we currently have on there and what we finally used um, at the World Championship were actually um, originally designed or took a lot of inspiration from Team 95. So as we were developing our climb, um, for people new to the team, we published basically everything we do on the build blog. So anybody who wants to follow along, all the other teams can watch what we're doing day to day. We publish quite a bit of what our CAD um, testing, anything like that gets published, quite a bit of it. Um, and so they started making a version of our climb for their own robot. Um, and one of the things they improved quite a lot on was the size and ability to latch a lot cleaner than what we were doing. We had much smaller latches, which did work, but it required a lot more precision and it was easier for the robot to potentially fall off the latches. Um, and that was very bad. So we did fall a couple times at different events and we did not want to do that. So we were able to use the improvements that they made um, to make our robot better and use a version of their um, climber latches to actually put on our robot and make our climb a lot more consistent going into the world championship. So there's another one on this side that's just not in CAD here, um, but they are um, symmetrical on the real robot. Um, there are a few other things we had to do. So we had some issues where we were bending some of these tubes. So we ended up putting in some more um, structural brackets into here. At some point, there's a lot of little work to make sure things are just a little bit stronger in places and weren't bending or flexing. Um, and a lot of times you have to do that, especially with things like the climb, where all of the other mechanisms are just kind of dealing with a very light ball. They don't have to have a lot of forces all the time. The climb is taking the entire 120, 150 pounds of the robot and lifting it up and down. So it's very easy to start bending some things. Um, like even early on 
in some of the original designs there was a single shaft going all the way across back here and that was causing all sorts of issues it was bending a lot so we ended up adding these supports and making it a much shorter shaft much shorter shaft so it couldn't bend as much um, so there's a lot of times like that where we're just constant little tweaks and iterations to improve and make it work um, similarly we had a bar back here so this this plate and this tube didn't exist um, on the robot for quite a while and so there's another plate here on the actual robot that is again symmetrical and these kind of tie the joints back here together so that allows the arms to go more in sync before it was easy for them to kind of get off and the whole robot would swing a little bit in different ways or lean or tilt so this helped quite a bit um, and that had to be designed around not having it interfere with the camera so that's why it like goes up and over so it doesn't hit our driver camera here um, it doesn't interfere with the hood or anything else either. So there's a lot of times where we have to package everything really nicely and cleanly um, and kind of make sure we have space for it. And Onshape lets, that do, lets us do that really easily because everyone can see all of the mechanisms at the same time in CAD. And we can all be working to uh, make sure the real robot's going to work as we finish up the design. Um, let's see. Yeah, so there's a few other things. We have these rods here are for supporting the side panels and kind of supporting the top of this structure so it doesn't start bending away. Because we didn't want, as we support like the whole weight of the robot on these latches or on these hooks, we didn't want the weight of the robot to try to like fall away and bend these parts backwards. Um, so these rods here are there to kind of support it, tie it into our intake plate here. Um, I think we did eventually, like we cracked one of the plates here. So we ended up uh, changing it out at one of our events to where there's a little metal plate that we had to very quickly make um, to come up from the frame to mount that rail. Um, so a lot of times there are little fixes and things that we're doing that probably can get fixed a little bit better sometimes, but as long as they're working for the event, they're fine. And then we should try to do more afterwards to figure out what the right fix is, if it's gonna eventually cause a problem. This one definitely didn't. The metal plate was probably a little bit stronger. It worked for what we needed to. Um, so there was no issue in leaving that there. Um, I think that's most everything in this robot. So we did have some issues that we saw now that we've gone through the off-season events where we started having um, the practice robot get take some different hits where we started breaking some panels. We broke our main breaker. So there's some, uh, we'll probably not have it this close to the frame perimeter in the future. We'll probably try to keep it a little farther inside while still being easy to access. That's somewhat of a issue with the rules is you do have to be able to access it easily without it being under any of the moving parts. So you wouldn't want to have like your main breaker mounted down under like this spinning spool or next to this gear or anything. Cause you don't want to have to touch the main breaker and potentially get your, get injured in some way because something else is moving. So those are things we'll consider as we start designing our future robots. Um, there are a lot of different iterations that we can go through and talk about. Like I said, I could probably do an hour on any one mechanism if we wanted to, and the people who've been working on them, um, either last year or through the off-season, can probably talk a lot about them as well. But we've changed materials multiple times or changed back. So at this point, this piece started as polycarb, but then we broke it a couple times, so we became aluminum. Then the aluminum didn't break, but it was causing other issues when it was getting bent and staying bent. Um, so we swapped it back to polycarb. So there's other times where we've had issues like that where... Sometimes the fix doesn't quite work and we have to come backwards a little bit. Um, or sometimes we're just constantly iterating, trying to make it a little bit better over time when we have issues that are causing us to affect matches or ways we think the robot can get better. All right, so I think that covers most everything in this robot. Um, as people have questions, we're definitely happy to answer and we'll still have two more off seasons we'll be competing with it and there'll be some changes going on to the 8515 version we're gonna have a different climb um, and there's some improvements and some changes we can make as we're figuring out what works and doesn't um, and we can still try try some things that we may be using in future robots um, there's some things we can definitely do in programming we're going to try to make the autonomous work a little bit better so there's quite a bit we can do and then we can also get working on having more people drive it and actually see how how they actually function a little bit um, as we move forward through the fall all right, thank you everybody.